everybody says it Antikythera. Is it that thing where you read it in print so often, but you, you never have someone read it to you, so you don't really know what to say? Is that kind of the phenomenon? It's exactly what it is. And I think everybody's afraid to say it because I, I watched a few YouTube videos on this and nobody says anything. There's no voiceover because I think everybody's afraid of the word Antikythera. I Googled and I found the people that are doing the most hardcore research on the topic. And I went and found podcasts that they were the people being interviewed on. And I just listened to how they said it. That's how I got there. Antikythera. I kind of did the same thing. I found some fancy academic symposium at Dartmouth and went and listened to how they talked about it. Oh, yeah. I read. I watched the one at Stanford. Oh, sweet. Yeah. So you came ready. Yeah, but I, I just focused on the one thing. You should probably bring everybody into what we're talking about. and then. But yeah, I just focused on the one area you told me to. Thank you for that. It, this was a gesture of trust on your part because it was possible that my idea for this episode was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to think it's a really good idea because for me, this topic, the Antikythera shipwreck, is it is one of the most fascinating things I have come across in years. I can't get enough of this thing. And as a history guy, I'm fanboying every time people go dive on this shipwreck and bring up something new. Here, here's the story. Around 1900, in fact, I think it was 1900, there were some Greek sponge divers with primitive diving equipment, who were trying to make their way to, I want to say, Tunisia. And so they're passing through all of those crystal clear Greek isles, and a storm comes up, and they have to put into the side of this little island, Antikythera, which is south of the Greek mainland, the way you would travel from modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor, to Rome. That's where all those little, like, little bitty islands, it looks like somebody hit the map with a shotgun, right? Yes, that's exactly it. Santorini is probably the most famous of all of them. Okay. Its uh, its old name was Thera, and Santorini is, oh, what do you call it? When a volcano blows up and all that's left is the rim, so you get like a... A caldera? Well, yeah, but a caldera in the ocean where, where all that's left... <laughs> I was going to say everybody dies. You'd see a bunch of dead people, but that that's not very nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but after everybody's dead... So yeah, it's that kind of island with like the the perfect white painted Greek buildings against the perfect blue water. And these sponge divers stop there and they're like, well, you know, look for sponges here because we have to wait anyway. And so they send the first diver down and he gets down into the water in this new unexplored territory for this team. And he immediately starts yanking on the get me up panic cord. And so they pull him up. They undo the screws and they pop off his big giant brass helmet. And he's like, there is a cemetery down there. There is some kind of ghoulish pile of bodies underneath us right now, except in Greek. He mentioned the horses as well, right? Yeah, horses, arms, men, women, all of this stuff. And so the the dive captain, thinking that seems a little bit strange, gets into the gear and he goes down. What's cool about this is they only have like 10 minutes of bottom time because this is way down there. I mean, this is like well over 100 feet deep. Yeah, and it drops off to something. I think the deepest spot in the area is maybe in the 100 meters and change. It's in the 300 plus feet range. And yeah, with this primitive equipment, like you can go down there, get a look and get back up. So can you imagine how badly they must have wanted to linger longer as they start to figure out that they're on one of the most amazing shipwreck discoveries of the ancient world. And that's what it turned out to be. I have to correct you. It was 180 feet, 180 feet deep. So we're splitting the difference between our two estimates. Yeah, exactly. That, that, okay. That's about right for everything we do. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, so they go on their, I don't know, their sponge trip. I don't know how sponge diving works. There's a better sponge place maybe. So they went, they did all of this on their way back through. They notified the Greek authorities in Athens And the Greeks took over the excavation. And the Greeks have still been in charge of this excavation going on 117 years after the fact. But but I heard a little bit about why this was such a big deal for national pride. Because the Greeks had just gotten their butts handed to them by the Ottomans, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, and so they were all like, we need something to rally around. Hey, how about, you remember when we were awesome and (laughs) we were the best in the world? Yeah, well, we found a boat of all that stuff. It's like the coolest time capsule ever, I don't know, ever found, right? I think it might be. 
And that's why I was so excited to introduce you to this and get your take on a couple of things that I'm too dumb to understand, which we'll get to in a minute. But this is the Hellenistic period, right? Now, now you're, I'm getting into your area. You're the history guy. You're welcome in my lane. I don't mind. Come on over. Who's the guy that got killed uh, in Syracuse? Don't come in my circles guy. Who is that? Yeah. That's that, Archimedes? That's Archimedes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I had a fish named Archimedes. He was a hero, but... Yeah, because Syracuse, even though it's on Sicily, where you know that's the soccer ball that the boot of Italy is kicking, that was always a, a very Greek part of what was otherwise an Italian or Roman part of the world. Well, the cool thing about having this time capsule from that time period is that was when all of the awesome scientific and mathematic discoveries happened, but we don't have a lot from that time period. That's why this is so cool to me, because Archimedes, I mean, the dude like figured out pi. I mean, it's a big deal, right? Yeah, I mean, it comes up from time to time. But but this whole story falls on the border between the Hellenic Age and the Hellenistic Age, and then it bleeds over into the Roman Age. Here's a quick version of what I mean by that. The Hellenic Age is the explicitly Greek era of ancient Greek history, mm-hmm. when you've got the powers that everybody's heard of, like Athens and Sparta, and all of their um, neighboring city-states. This goes all the way back to the age of Homer and the Trojan War, and the stuff where legend and history mingle, like that far back. But then, in the 4th century BC, so the 300s, a guy from just up the road from mainland Greece in Macedonia named Philip II comes down and wages war against the Greeks, and he wins, which was unthinkable because the Greeks had beat the mighty Persians. But the Greeks had fought against each other in a bunch of civil wars called the Peloponnesian Wars. They were weak. The Macedonians beat them. But then Philip, the one-eyed leader, the second, he dies, and his 18-year-old son, Alexander, takes over. That guy. Yeah, even people who aren't into history have heard of Alexander. So Alexander has to settle things down on the Greek peninsula. And then he's like, you know what? My dad wanted to conquer the world. I've always kind of wanted to conquer the world. I'm young and dumb enough to think that might work. (laughs) I'm just going to go do it. And so he takes a Greek and Macedonian army and he just starts marching. And he beats uh, the, the Persian leader Darius at a famous battle called Issus, another one called Gagamela. He travels all around. He, he quote unquote, liberates Jerusalem. He ex- establishes the town of Alexandria. He makes Alexandria's everywhere. Eventually, he goes on and straight up conquers the Persian capitals of Babylon, Susa, Persepolis, and goes all the way to India before he dies as a young man at the age of 33, I think. I think he was the same age as Jesus, and doesn't leave an heir. And so his generals divide up everything that's left of his conquest. And this is the age that we call the Hellenistic Age. Hellenistic being like, it's like Greekish. It's Hellenistic. Oh, Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So we're we're just after like the grand, it, it, there never was a Greek empire, right? But just, what did, what did you call that time? Yeah, well, there was a Greekish empire. There was a Hellenistic empire under Alexander. And then his generals had little smaller empires born out of his big empire in the late 300s BC. So I think what you're trying to say is it was a really freaking long time ago. <laughs> is that what well, you're I'm trying, trying to say that, but I'm also trying to say there's a bunch of times from a really freaking long time ago where things were pretty static. This is an incredibly dynamic moment in history that we're talking about these events happening around. Like maybe the most dynamic moment in history save the last hundred years. Hmm. Because what, what Alexander did is he wanted to take Greek culture and spread it all over the place, but he also wanted to grab the best ideas from all over the place and integrate it into Greek culture. So he intentionally brought along all kinds of people and had them intermarry with people from every people group he met along the way and Greekified the whole world. But Greece also became whole worldified in the process. So all of these ideas come flooding in to the classical world from all corners in ways that had never happened. And so mathematics and philosophy just take this giant leap forward. And Alexander, frankly, is qualified to handle it. I mean, Aristotle was his personal tutor. And so it's a huge transition moment where genius ideas are happening in bunches. That's what I'm driving at. How do we get to the boat, though? Like, do we know anything about this boat? Yeah. So the boat that these sponge divers found was a Roman ship. Did you read about how they figured out that it was Roman and not Greek? No, go ahead. I I don't know how they know. 
So the Romans built boats out of elm. The Greeks built boats out of pine. I'm almost sure that's correct. And it's an elm boat. So they know it was a Roman boat. And that helps them even know what the destination of that ship must have been. You know, it's really, really strange that you say that. Why? The whole fascinating thing about this is they had all kinds of technology on this boat that we didn't think existed at the time, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to believe this, but I found this one little clip online. They actually had a black box on the boat. You know, like when an airplane goes down, they, they go back and play the recordings. That's incredible. Yeah, I know. I know. And you can actually hear the moment of the shipwreck. Would you Would you like to hear it? I would love to. Did the people back then sound a lot different from you and I? They did. They did. Let, let, let me just play this little piece for you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> hey, Barnacles! Barnacles! Hail, Testicles! How goes the voyage? It's good. I'm, I'm having problems with my mechanism over here. I wouldn't know the first thing about your mechanism... And I'm sorry I can't help you right now. I'm too busy sculpting. Why are you sculpting on a ship, Barnacles? We we have things to do, places to go. I'm just working with this very complicated mechanism crafted from brass plates. Because, Testicles, (laughs) the seas are so calm that it seemed like perfect conditions for precise sculpting. Hark, what is that on the horizon? Hark, I dare not say. Let me just consult my overly complicated device that I have brought along on this voyage. I felt so confident in our plan, given the season and our knowledge of trade winds in this particular year in antiquity. (laughs) That's right. This is a a common trade route. Oh, snap. That's getting bad. What do we do? I am also concerned and fear that we may perish. But an additional concern is what will be the fate of this bounty that we carry back Possibly for the dictator Sulla, if this is the year 75 BC. Or possibly for Julius Caesar, if this is somewhat later. Scholars disagree. I'm afraid. Hold me, Barnacles. The main mast has just snapped off. Why? We have the strongest elm. I choose instead to hold on to the sculpture. It's priceless. (laughs) Hark, the ship is breaking up, Testicles. What do we do? What do we do? Perhaps this is goodbye. Oh, I just figured it out. I entered the longitude wrong in my mechanism. Goodbye, Barnacles. <laughs> curse, curse you, and curse your foolhardy dependence on science and math and numbers. Only humanities could have saved us from this tragedy. I pray that one day a team of restorationists will reassemble the perfect sculpture that I have put together here. No one person could get this right. I hope it's at least a 50-year process and that one day it makes the Greek people proud. That's the thing I like about history is you get to think about there were actual people that were on this ship that went down. And that's what we kind of lose when we read these articles about all this cool stuff on the ship, right? There were actual people like Barnacles and Testicles, on the ship. Yeah, no doubt. Those exact names. (laughs) Are those even Greek-sounding names? Vaguely. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) That's that's the way I Greekify things. I just put Cles on the end of it, and that's how it works. (laughs) All right, so I want to talk about the mechanism. That's what you had me research, correct? Yeah, so it's this device that is sitting there, and people have all kinds of theories about it, but I intentionally didn't research it to stay out of your lane. So that you could explain the thing to me. Thanks for lobbing me the softball. I'm here to help. Okay, so here's the deal. This mechanism, the Antikythera mechanism, I did some research. The two people that I listened to mainly was this one guy in Greece. His name was Xenophon Moses. Moses, I believe is his name. But he's a physicist in Greece. And his whole thing is he's on the Antikythera mechanism research project. And so the guy is super smart. He knows mechanics. He knows astronomy. He he knows all kinds of stuff, orbital mechanics. And just to hear him talk about it, and he has theories that other people don't have. Basically, the mechanism is this. Imagine something about the size of a shoebox, and on one side you have a crank. Like if you were to set the shoebox up on its small side facing you, and on like the right side of the device, let's say there's this input for a crank or something. Facing you, there would be two 
spiral looking things with arms on them. And on the other side, you have this one big dial that has what basically looks like the moon going around the earth. And then you have all these other things going around it. Wait, you can see, like it has a depiction of the moon and the earth engraved on it? No, it's even cooler than that. The moon is like a marble. Imagine a marble that's black on one side and white on the other. 50-50, right? Okay. And so we're going to have to paint a a, a visual image for your brain here. So imagine you're on a merry-go-round, right? And you had a, a rod that you were holding out. You're standing in the center of the merry-go-round. You're holding this rod way out, and you've got a uh, a big basketball on the end of that rod that can roll, right? Sure. And we painted the top of the basketball white and the bottom of it black. And then when the merry-go-round turns, that ball would turn white, black, white, black. But at certain points, it would be different phases of white or black. So the mechanism works like that. In the center, you know, it has a circle, and then it's got a marble that's white and black like that that rolls around the outside that depicts the phases of the moon. How cool is that? I've avoided learning anything about this. I had no idea that was part of the equation. Yeah, exactly. So here's the deal. The reason this is so amazing is because, A, we had no idea that back in the Hellenistic period, they had the ability to machine or fabricate, whatever word you want to use, gears with teeth that were this fine. We had no idea they had this amount of knowledge of heavenly bodies, all these things. This is the mind-blowing part. This guy, Xenophon Moises from the Antikythera Mechanism Research Project, he said this. There is a, well, I don't know if you know this. So do you know how the moon goes around the earth? Do you know what shape it goes around the earth in? I feel like it's a slight ellipse. Yes, it's an ellipse. And so when the moon is far away from the earth, it's going slower relative to us. But when it's closer to the Earth, it's going faster, right? That's how orbital mechanics and like Kepler's second law works. Okay, because of where it's at on the ellipse. Yeah, exactly. You know, imagine this. When the the moon is really far away, Earth's gravity affects it less. And so it's pulling it, you know, and it's moving slower. But when it, you know, kind of dive bombs the Earth on the short side of the ellipse, it'll just be screaming really fast by the Earth, right? Sure. It's like in every sci-fi movie. When you only have impulse power and you need to find a way to develop momentum, you use the gravity of a local moon or planet to slingshot you around it for added speed. Uh, that's kind of, it's, it's a different thing, but you know, you're getting it. It seems credible. Well, the point is when the moon is closer to the earth, it moves faster. That's the point. I can work with that. So how do you model that with circular gears? They figured that out way back in the day, and they created an ingenious, um, it's like an ellipsoidal gearing mechanism. It's basically a circular gear inside of a gear, and then they had a really interesting way. Uh, It's hard to explain, Matt, but long story short, they could create elliptical motion with circular gears. When did we figure that out in modern times? We thought it was like 1700s. To be fair... The West, we think that we invented all smart stuff, and we didn't. That's a little bit of chronological snobbery going on there. And a lot of the stuff we know, we got from Islam, right? Islamic scholars. Yo, yeah, the, there's, a, there's a golden age of Islamic mathematicians and historians. There's a guy named Averroes who was key in that. And actually, even a lot of the ancient texts, a lot of what we learned about Greek science, we actually learned through the Middle East because they had a bunch of those old Greek texts that we had lost, and we got them back through our contact with them in the Middle Ages. This is what's so interesting. They created a device where you could input your latitude, longitude, what day it is, what hour it is, and it could tell you the position of all five known planets that they could see with the naked eye. And Was one of them Uranus? Yes. No, it wasn't actually. They didn't know about Uranus at that point in time. Uranus is so... Never mind. There's so many jokes there. Anyway, so (laughs) long story short, not only could this device calculate the position of each of these planets, it knew this for several years. I mean, like you could turn a crank and you could figure out where Mars was going to be five years from now. We're talking about something the size of a shoebox, Matt. This is amazing. Is this a navigation computer? It could be. I mean, that's that's one of the main ways that people could tell time, which was the Jovian methods. You could take 
the moons around Jupiter, and if you knew what time it would come in front of Jupiter or you know behind it, you you could figure out the time. But that's that's the topic for another day. But here's the kicker. There was something else on the other side. Remember I told you about the two spirals on the other side of the box? Yeah, yeah. This is mind-blowing to me. It could calculate solar eclipses and lunar eclipses. What? Yeah. How crazy is that? What's crazy to me about it is that it's one device. Exactly. It seems like you'd want to make another device to handle the eclipse stuff over a window of... Well, if you're talking about eclipses, how many years could this account for at a time? I knew you were going to ask that. I, I want to say this device would span 200 years. I have to go figure it out. I don't I don't Whoa. know. They, they, they told me this in one of the things I listened to, but I don't remember the span of this device. Okay, but the point is, we're not talking about a calendar like we think of a calendar where it handles basically a year. We're talking about something that would have covered lifetimes, maybe that much. You buy a device for your family kind of thing. And your family, ha- it yeah. passes it down from generation to generation, and you can all know when the eclipses are going to happen. <laughs> okay, I got a question. Yeah. Does it look like these gears were, well, they couldn't have been made by hand to have been precise enough to project that out. These had to have been machined. Of course they could be made by hand. Really? Yeah, of course you can. You can make, you could use a file and you can make all kinds of crazy stuff. Do they think that's how it was made? No, they don't know that. Or at least I didn't get that deep into it. The one thing I really want to know and I, I tried to find this answer, and I couldn't find it. There's a specific type of curve on a gear tooth called an involute curve. Don't know what that is. It's a very special thing for mechanical engineers. If you have two gears, and you put them together, and you mesh them so that you know, you're know you transmitting torque from one gear to the other, you want, sure. you want an involute curve so that you don't have backlash. If you put your fingers together, you know your two hands... You can move your fingers up and down from your right hand, and it it won't mesh completely with your left hand. That's backlash, that little movement between your fingers. Right, yep. An involute curve is a really special way to make gears always have basically contact. So as one tooth is disengaging, you have another one that's fully engaged and another one that's starting to engage. So that improves accuracy, that reduces torque and friction where you don't want it. And I would assume that would also increase the lifespan of the device. That and uh, it also reduces noise. You're absolutely right. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So all these things are fascinating. And and I really wanted to know if it had involute curvature on the gears, but I couldn't find that uh, in the amount of time I allocated to, to study this. But the really fascinating thing is that there's a crank and the crank it's just like the side of the box. It's like, oh, yeah, and here's where you crank it. Now, what we don't know is we don't know what the inputs were to this device. And a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, you would just crank it to whatever latitude and longitude you were and what month and the day it was, which is, you know, stuff you could figure out. And then, you know, you could pick the hour by where the sun was in the sky, and then you know where the planets are. But this guy that's on the uh, the research project, he has another theory. He says, you know... There's an input mechanism, and if they could do all this, what's to say they didn't have some form of way of turning that in an automated fashion, right? Sure, like a a spring, something that's coiled, like the way you wind a watch? A clock, just a clock, you know, whatever that would be. So think about this. What if this device, this is Destin talking, I didn't read this anywhere. What if this device is an app? An app? An app, like an application, like... A lot of people call this device a computer, and there's some people that disagree because computers normally have memory. But I would argue there is an input to this, and it's doing a computation for you, and it's giving you an output. Maybe you could call it a computer if the memory is the preloaded information that you're putting in there, but I don't know. I think app is a better term. No, that's making a ton of sense because your app isn't what does the processing. So what is doing the processing? Your brain? The data in the book that accompanies it? Or rather, what is providing the input? My question is the input to the device. I think it's plausible that the Greeks had some form of clock, like a standardized clock with a a shaft that would rotate at a certain speed. I think it's more than plausible, and I'll tell you why in a minute. So I think... What's interesting is they might have this standard clock in, you know, every town or something like that, and they could go plug up an antikythera mechanism or whatever it would. This thing had a a name, by the way. Oh, you know what? 
Xenophon said something else. He said the interesting thing about this is there's actually Greek letters on the device. Like you can straight up read what things are. And, and they talked about the months on the device were Doric. Another thing he said is there were instructions on the device that explained how to use it. Like a straight up user's guide. Really? And you can still read it on there? Yeah, they can still read it. Not the whole thing. Some of it's faded away, but they can still read a lot of it. And a lot of the gears, like each individual gear would have like the name on it, like this is for days or whatever it is. He said that in ancient literature, they find references to these types of devices. Yes. Anyway, this guy says that in, in ancient literature, these devices or something like these devices, this is the only known one to exist. They're re referred to as tablets or something along those lines. Which is fascinating, man. These guys had little tablets like we do to calculate things. The whole fascinating thing of all this is we had no idea that this civilization was that advanced. And it, it sets my brain on fire. Because what, what else did they have that we don't have? You know? Oh, it has to be a ton, man. And there are these little hints that you find in history about advanced ideas, even advanced civilizations. I mean, the most famous that everybody's heard of is Plato's one-sentence reference to this great civilization that in a single day fell into the sea, right? Atlantis? Everybody's heard of that. Yeah. I mean, you got a Disney movie about it. And interestingly, on that note, and this quick rabbit trail, and then I'm coming back to your question, the island I referenced earlier, Santorini, or in the Greeks called it Thera, now it's kind of a little, I don't even know what you call it, it's a series of little miniature islands in the shape of a caldera, but it was one single island back around maybe 1400 BC, and the whole thing exploded. And a lot of people think that the tidal wave created by this enormous ancient eruption is what crushed the Minoan civilization on Crete, and maybe even was in some way related to the perceptions that contemporary thinkers had about the Exodus and maybe even the parting of the sea account in the Old Testament. Are you talking about Krakatoa? No, Krakatoa, which people think is the loudest sound ever generated on Earth, I think that was in the 19th century. Oh, wow. Okay. It's a completely different deal. I'm sorry. But this eruption threw chunks of pumice the size of Volkswagen, you know, as far as Egypt or the ancient Near East. This thing was unbelievably powerful. And so just, as I said, interesting side note, a lot of people think Plato might have been talking about the civilization that was destroyed as a result of that eruption. But there are all kinds of these little mysteries where you just get one phrase here or there about crazy advanced ideas that the Greeks had during this moment of genius thought. And one of them is there's this dude named Hero of Alexandria who described the work of a mathematician named Archytas, who would have been a contemporary of Aristotle. Um, and around 350 BC, this guy supposedly had a mechanical, geared, wooden dove that could fly on its own. What? Yeah. Like, this is in literature. Yeah. Obviously, we don't have a, a prototype. A prototype? Antitype? I don't know what you even call it when it's that far after the fact, but we don't have one of these sitting around. But it's described, if I recall correctly, one of the Greek historians who was in the Middle East talked about the technological advancements of the Babylonians and how they also had little mechanical birds, or maybe if memory serves, like even like an entire little geared mechanical menagerie of animals that the king or emperor or whatever had at the time. It's like the tiki room at Disney World, all these little birds that'll just do stuff. I bet they could generate sounds too. Yeah, except... Now it's creepy and disappointing when you look at animatronics like Billy Bob from Showbiz Pizza. But back then, that must have been the coolest thing anybody... I'm glad you understood that. Yeah, I did. Back then, that would have been the coolest thing that anybody had ever seen, ever. Man. When you were a kid, did you see Clash of the Titans? No. That really cheeseball, claymation action show? I did not. I'm sorry. In, in 1981, I went to my first movie ever. It was Clash of the Titans, and they had a robot bird that I think was purported to have been made by Archimedes. Maybe I'm making that part up. I haven't seen this movie in oh, a little while, Oh, is this the while, silver obviously. bird? Yeah, it's the little robot I have some kind of vague silver. memory. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember anything about it either, but I think I'm connecting the dots here. In that movie, that must have been a reference to whatever Archidus, the mathematician, had going with this 
mechanical wooden dove. So all of that's to say, there's all these little hints of genius stuff that we're just figuring out now. We're just figured out in the last couple hundred years. Man, what if we take a little break and then we come back and talk about a couple other things that happened in the ship? Yeah, I got some stuff that I'm really excited to share. This episode of No Dumb Questions is brought to you by HelloFresh. HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service that shops, plans, and delivers your favorite step-by-step recipes and pre-measured ingredients so you can just cook, eat, and enjoy. It really is about that easy. My wife and I really like HelloFresh. Part of the reason we like it is because the food is just good. I mean, you would expect that. That's kind of what they're into. But they've got chef-curated recipes that are always changing, so it's kind of fun to keep you out of a rut. I know some people really like the veggie-only thing, and I can respect that, but I am a committed carnivore. And their meal plans definitely accommodate people like me, as well as our family, which works great because if if you're making a meal, you want your kids to eat and be happy. And this seems to get that done really well for us. So in addition to the selection and flexibility aspect of HelloFresh, we also really like the convenience side of things. For whatever reason, I find myself traveling a lot. Maybe it's because of my delusional self-importance. But whether it's delusional or not, I'm not always around. And so it's nice to be a part of things where we can hit pause when we don't want stuff showing up at our house and where we can hit go when we are going to be around. So you can choose your delivery date and make it work best for your schedule. You can pause things when you're going to be out of town. The ingredients come pre-measured and accurate so you're not wasting food and it's also delivered to your door in recyclable insulated packaging that gets the food there the right way another thing that i really like about this is that we make the food and we get to include the kids in that we get to have fun with it i learn things when we cook this and it's really nice for me to think outside of macaroni and cheese and hot dogs which have till date been my specialty so hellofresh will expand your horizons it's definitely had that effect on me If you haven't tried it out yet, I hope you will give HelloFresh a shot. For $30 off your first week of HelloFresh, visit HelloFresh.com slash NDQ and enter the promo code NDQ. Again, that's HelloFresh at HelloFresh.com slash NDQ, promo code NDQ. All right, let's get back to the conversation. What other stuff do you have like that? In terms of cool old Greek discoveries or other stuff from the boat? Either one, man. Let's talk about other stuff from the boat, because I'm, I'm really excited to get to this. Okay. Remember when the, the first sponge diver went down, he said it looked like there was a ton of bodies and horses and stuff down there, and he freaked out. Well, of course, we found most of that stuff. Well, I don't know if we found most of it, but we found a ton of things, like maybe 50 sculptures or sculpture fragments yeah. have been pulled up. Yeah. They started excavating all of this a few years after the fact, and they started pulling up horses, and they found four marble horses that might have been part of a a bigger sculpture of maybe Athena in her chariot behind the horses. Have you seen? No, I I heard this part, and I heard like one of the horses broke or something. Yes, and they still haven't found it. It, it, These were like the first four things to come up were these marble sculptures of chariot horses, and they got the fourth one right up to being able to grab it, and I can empathize with this from fishing, and the equipment gave way, the rigging in this case, turned loose and this horse fell down into the the deepest part of the site and they still haven't recovered the fourth horse. Do you know much about recovery diving, by the way? No. Have you ever done it? I have been diving once, precisely once. I've been trained to do it just enough to say I've been trained to do it. Like, you know, I went on two dives. So you take a bag under there with you and then the bag has ropes on it and you tie it off to whatever you're, you're bringing up. And then you pump air into the bag. Oh. Yeah, and then it'll you create a buoyant force that'll bring it up. Sure, because of how air is. But the problem is, as the air comes up, it will expand. That was the biggest thing I learned about scuba diving. It'll expand as it goes up. And so... So then the sculpture gets the bends? Yeah. That's the worst, man. <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> but it gets broken in this case. But basically, you have to relieve air as you ascend. But imagine this, you go to the bottom of the ocean, somehow you take a breath, you could slowly swim up and exhale the whole way, never have to breathe again. You just exhale all the way up. It's called a CISA, a controlled what? emergency swimming ascent. Okay, wait a second though. You mean like without your lungs exploding, but it's not like, I mean, the, the oxygen would still be depleted through your lungs, through the alveoli as it gets sucked away into the blood. It's not like new oxygen is happening. 
Well, think about this. So if you were to, again, minimum safety limits and stuff like that, you know, there's certain times you can be on the bottom. They call it bottom time. Just Yeah, safety is for posers. Go ahead. <laughs> no, scuba diving, you can really get wrecked in a hurry. But let's assume that we're just going to talk about physics and we don't have to worry about nitrogen or bloodstream. If you go to like 80 feet, for example, okay, let's say you go straight down to 80 feet, you were to take a breath from a pressurized breathing system of some sort. You could then open your mouth, point up, and start swimming straight up and exhale. And you would exhale all the way to the surface because that compressed gas in your lungs at the bottom, as you swim up, the pressure around you goes down. And so that volume of air that you have in your lungs will grow. And so as it grows, more of it can expand and it just it just comes straight out your mouth. Okay, I'm fully engaging with this rabbit trail because I'm intrigued. But what I'm saying is you're talking about the total volume of air in its compressed state and in its gradually uncompressing state. What I'm saying is wouldn't the oxygen content, though, be the same all the way down under pressure as it is up at the top. So wouldn't you burn through your oxygen? You're not making more oxygen as you go up and slowly exhale, are you? We're just talking about volume. You're pulling from the source. Like, let's just use pure oxygen. A liter of pure oxygen up here at the surface, and then you go 100 feet down, it'll compress like crazy. I mean, it'll be hardly anything when you get down that deep compared to what it is up here. Long story short, it's only the oxygen that's engaging with your lungs that you're using. And so as it expands more, there's more oxygen inside that compressed volume. Does that make sense? You're saying you would have oxygen all the way up. Yeah. At least I did when I did it. Huh. I probably did it from, how to do, probably 20 feet is what I did it from. In fact, if you don't breathe out as you swim up, you will literally explode. I'm against that. I am too. By the way, you should always, always be trained in anything you do. This is the general disclaimer. Oh, we're doing this. Okay. No, dude, are, are you a scuba diver? No, I've, I, I've just done it once. So no, I cannot claim to be this. I think generally safety is for weak people. But go <laughs> ahead, do your disclaimer. When did you scuba dive without being trained? <laughs> I feel like I'm basically an expert because of that time I scuba dived. Please say it was like Barbados or something. Nicaragua. No, it was in the swimming pool in Lander, Wyoming. Oh, okay. And I felt like it was easy. I don't know why people get so worked <laughs> up about it. So the, the the craziest moment I ever had scuba diving, I was in Australia, and there's this guy named Chris that took us to Australia to do this. It was called Science Week back back in the day. I don't know. They do it every year. But the big... How long does it last? <laughs> the big deal was getting to go dive in the Great Barrier Reef, which was huge. And that's that video I did uh, of mapping it. Long story short, we get down to about 70 or 80 feet, which is very, very deep by my standards. We're down there, and my mask breaks. What? Yeah, the back of my mask just flips off. The little thing that holds it to your the side there just breaks. Yeah. And it starts falling off my head, and I grab it, and I was like, oh, wow, cool. I'm blind at 70 feet. I can't go straight up because I have to decompress on the way up, so I have to do this safely. Hmm. And so... I just found a rock and I grabbed it and I sat there and I took my mask in my other hand and I held it to my face and I, I put air in it through my nose. Sure. Got yep. to the point where I could see. And then I looked around and then Chris, uh, you know, you always dive with a buddy. Chris was chasing a fish or something and he was, you know, really close to me. And he turned around, he saw me and he's like, hey, me and you, we're going up. I was like, cool, let's do it. And I don't know, it was, it was crazy. It was scary. So I can't imagine this dude at 180 feet down, seeing dead bodies. And he's like, I'm out. <laughs> I gotta go up oh, now. I would go into hardcore panic mode. And we were just in Nicaragua. We flew out to this tiny little island called, what's well, called Big Corn Island. One of the things that we wanted to do there was snorkel out from shore because there's reef all around half of the island. And it's nice reef. But it was super windy and choppy. And so... My buddy and I, our, our wives weren't up for going out that far, but Brett, he was all in. And so we swam way, way out, almost to the breakers, which are quite a ways out from shore. But I'm a pretty confident swimmer. I feel pretty good out there. But man, even at surface depth, it just gets in your head a little bit. And if there's anything that seems wrong, 
you suddenly have this sense of, I am so far from anything. I'm so far from where I can be in control and in my environment. And I've been in the water with sharks before, and I like that. What? It's a fun rush and everything. What? Yeah, nurse sharks. I mean, they're not going to murder you, but they're bigger than me. Not that that's a great accomplishment. No, thanks. See, I think it's sweet. But there's still just this rush of something's amiss and I'm out of control. This is not the, the element for humans. And so it is not hard for me, even based on that experience from a couple of weeks ago, as the wind started to kick up and it felt a little more out of control, to imagine the panic at seeing this stuff. And I wonder if if some of the sculptures that we can now see that have been pulled up are the things that he was looking at. Because there's one called the the Philosopher. Oh, yeah. Or the Antikythera Philosopher. Yep. And it's a haunting sculpture. Have you seen it? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's just a bust of a dude with a fantastic beard, might I add. That beard would pass by all standards today as well. But he's got this goofy look and the way they did the eyes, it's just haunting. If I drop to 100 feet and turn around and quickly that's staring me in the face, yeah, they're going to have to clean out that suit. <laughs> I'm referencing pooping in it. You pee in suits all the time. You know that, right? Well, it's for warmth. Yeah. <laughs> so here's the deal. Yeah, I do that in my waders while I fish. How do you think they had light down there in 1900? Well, I don't know. How dark does it get at 100 feet? I really don't know. I could see in Australia at 100 feet, but I mean, this is like a silty area, isn't it? I don't know. I don't think so. No, it it's really clear. I mean, the, the Greek Isles are like our Caribbean. It's blue and perfect and beautiful. Now, the footage I've seen of them diving, it's there's some artificial light, but you can see light from the surface still. That's awesome. Tell me more about stuff on the boat. Okay. They found the stuff that you would expect them to find. Shipping containers. Like We think of plastic tubs or big oil drums as being just like the stuff you ship things in. They found the shipping item of the day, which are these these big pots that are about half the size of a person with two handles. They found a bunch of them. Obviously, most of them were busted up, but some of them were fully intact. So that's pretty cool. Additionally, they found coins and artifacts that all come from mainland Asia Minor or modern day Turkey. And those coins are part of how they think they know where this boat was leaving from. There was nothing that they found that is from the Greek mainland, like Athens, Sparta, that kind of stuff. But there is stuff that they found on a couple of little islands or that that is derived from maybe, uh, I don't remember now. I want to say Kos and Rhodes, maybe. Rhodes was the rich island, right? One of them, sure. And so it looks like we can reestablish the route that this boat must have taken And we can figure out where they were headed because of the construction of the boat, which we covered, which was Elm, and because there just aren't a lot of places in roughly 70 BC where a boat with that much value would be headed other than Rome. Not a lot of people could have afforded what was on this boat. I mean, we're talking about 50 plus hand-carved sculptures and untold wealth in coin just sitting at the bottom of the ocean. Well, where is that going? There's nowhere further west. It wouldn't have been going to Spain. That kind of wealth wasn't out there. It's clearly headed to Rome. So then you can start to do the math based on the age of the coins and the shape and size of the shipping containers. Because, you know, if you found a crate that kids kept their toys in in 1970, you could tell the difference between a crate that somebody went and bought from Ikea in 2015 that kids keep toys in. Right. Well, these people are nuanced in that from Greek culture, and they could do the same math there. So we're real close to having a sense of when this must have been, which means that we can also do the math on who was rich enough to commission a boat like that. For the longest time, the theory was that this ship was commissioned by Cornelius Sulla, who was the dictator of Rome, who kind of set everything in motion that led to Julius Caesar ending up in charge. But... Jacques Cousteau, you remember him, the famous oceanographer? (laughs) (laughs) He was the last non-Greek diver allowed on the site until very recently by the Greek government. And he pulled up a bunch of coins that made it impossible for Sulla to have been the one who commissioned this boat, which means that we move forward about 10 years. I don't understand. How could coins make it impossible? Oh, it was after him. Right. Okay. Yeah. So if it's after Sulla, it couldn't have been commissioned by Sulla. Gotcha. Okay. And so what that means is if we align what we know about the shape of the pottery and what we know about 
the coinage that's on board, it makes Julius Caesar a legitimate candidate for who commissioned the boat. I think that's fascinating. So here's a question. You talked about these pots Mm -hmm. that they ship liquids in, you know. I did hear this Dr. Brendan Foley. He said they could actually pull DNA out of those things. It's it's a type of research he referred to called ADNA. Okay, I don't I don't know what that is. Ancient DNA. Oh, well, that's what the A stands for. Get it. So we thought, you know, hey, these are it's wine. He he says it's like that, but not wine. It's like this really weird mix of twelve different things, and it's it's nothing like what we think of as being wine today. But one question I have about those pots, it starts with an A. How do you how do you say those? Oh, I don't, yeah, I, I've heard people use the word as well. I don't remember the name. Amphora, is it amphora? Amphora, is that it? Amphora might be right. Okay, I'm not reading that. I'm just trying to remember what I heard. But do they have a flat bottom or a conical bottom? Uh, they have a conical bottom. Why? Because I've seen it drawn both ways, and I don't understand why you would have a conical bottom on on a thing like that that contains liquid. I have a couple of thoughts on this, and I don't know for sure the answer, but I've definitely seen... Those, what are we calling them? Amphora? Yeah, it might be wrong, but let's just go for it. Okay. They sit in like a little cast iron container so that you can move the empties to a storage room and then bring the fresh stuff in. And they sit up a little bit higher for more convenient access if you're working around the house. Another reason that they might have that conical bottom just crosses my mind having been to Pompeii this summer. I've been there a few times and they've got a few of these kitchens restored that just have cut out holes in the countertop where it looks like you could slide in a container. And so maybe they just built things to accommodate that shape because they didn't have to stand up. I don't know. Seems like a flat bottom would make a lot more sense, but I could see how the cone bottom could be used based on other things I've seen. Oh, so it's like a, oh, oh, wow. You know what? If it's a cone, okay, so you know how when you have a cup holder in your car Uh and the cup's too big? Uh Uh-huh. Hey! They wouldn't have that problem. There you go. Yeah, because you just put it in as far as it needs to go. So if it's not a standardized size... Holy yeah. cow. Man, we, we kind of got there, didn't we? Man, that's interesting. It works for me. <laughs> there's there's some like ancient archaeologists right now going, look, listen to these idiots. They have these guys are morons. <laughs> they are bad at literally everything. What does he Why know? Why do I listen to this? It's just bleeps and screaming. It's, re- and it's probably ill-informed this, opinions. It's probably <laughs> the same guy that thought the Antikythera mechanism couldn't exist. Yeah, this is. Yeah, it, take that. It's all about cup holders, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, just a quick word of thanks to everybody who supports us through Patreon.com. That means a huge amount. It frees us up financially to try and do more and better and interestinger things. So thank you very, very much to all of you. I know there are a ton of listeners here who don't support us on Patreon, and I'm really grateful to you as well. Thank you for being here also. If you are in a place where you feel like checking that out and maybe becoming a supporter of No Dumb Questions, you can do that at patreon.com slash no dumb questions, or you cannot, and that's cool too. Either way, thanks for being a part of the conversation. Let's go talk about shipwrecks more. So you add all of that up, and you know, maybe this is Pompeii or Julius Caesar or somebody less important. I don't know, but it's kind of fun and romantic to imagine that it was headed for one of those rock stars of Roman history. But it is that kind of wealth. I mean, you, you just shouldn't find this kind of trove. To me, the most interesting thing on the boat is one sculpture in particular. It's called the Antikythera Youth. And it is this sculpture that they pulled up in pieces. I don't even know how many, but it must have been dozens of bronze pieces. And they tried to reassemble this thing around the turn of the century. There was a French guy they brought in, and he did all kind of work. He, he smoothed it over to take care of the pock marks that you know, the corrosion had caused. He puttied the thing together and created something that most people thought was close, but not great. Humpty Dumpty, please. <laughs> Humpty Dumpty. That's well said. <laughs> yeah, I think you win the podcast. Whatever. He, so it's a naked dude, because they were into naked dudes. And he's a young man with impressive musculature and kind of a gentle look on his face, reaching forward, almost like he's showing you a baseball or something. Oh, that's I mean, that's cool. his pose. Yeah. And, and so the obvious question is, what was in his hand? A fish, obviously. 
Oh, that's exactly what I wasn't going to say. Whatever is in his hand is probably the answer to who he is. And so some people say it's an apple, which would mean that, I don't remember, it's some dude, maybe, uh, I think young Hercules, there's an, a rendition of him or a story about him holding up some important mythical apple. Uh, some people think that it might be Paris holding up some other mythical important apple. Some people think that it might be Apollo. And some people think, and this is my favorite, I like to imagine this is what it is, that it's Perseus, who again, factors into Clash of the Titans, holding up the head of the Gorgon. I know that Gorgons can turn you to stone, so maybe it is Medusa. Ooh. Maybe a Gorgon is like a Medusa head. I'm going with that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. So whatever the case, he's holding up some grisly thing or maybe some really nice thing, but we don't know what it was. And so one of the things I am most excited about for with each of these dives that are happening now is that maybe they find whatever was in his hand and it solves this historical riddle. But further, what is fascinating about this sculpture is that they decided to take another run at it in like the 1950s. They brought in another guy, or actually I think this guy worked there, and he took unbelievable amounts of time to take apart what the previous restorationist had done, to scrape off all of the smoothing putty or whatever the substance was that the previous restorationist slapped on the whole thing, and he started over. And what he figured out was that the old restoration had the body twisted in the wrong way. And so he does all this work and he documents every step of the way. And I mean, this thing looks like a big tumor clawed when they get it out. You got to understand, it's not like a smooth bronze sculpture. It's all Bar barnacled, barnacled up yeah. and encrusted. Yeah. And so how do you get that stuff off without destroying this priceless piece of art? Well, you don't have to. You can, that's the beauty of modern technology. You can use a CT scanner or, you know, some form of x-ray tomography and you can figure out exactly what shape it's supposed to be and then 3D print one. In fact, one of these guys, I know I'm derailing your, your thoughts here. Derail away. This is fascinating. This Dr. Brendan Foley, he was talking to this guy and he's like, hey, check this out. I've got this thing on my desk that we found it. It looked like it was part of a couch. It was made out of bronze. He said couch. And they scanned it. And then as soon as they scanned it, they were like, oh, man, look how fragile this is. And they handed it off. Hey, what's this down here in the cracks of the couch? It's, it's an ancient <laughs> remote control. <laughs> That's, that was a good one. Dude, it could, you know, we're sitting here laughing, but who knows, man? I mean, I'm it, maybe not electronic, but who knows what these guys could do or gals, whatever. So they handed this item to one of the other researchers. And like as soon as they handed it to him, it just crumbled in his hands because, you know, it's oxidized. Mm. But they had just scanned it, so they just went and 3D printed it. And it's really cool. They have an infinite number of them now. They can just print these things. One, that's incredible. Two, I'm so glad they had didn't have to do that with the Antikythera youth. Because this sculpture, when Dude was done doing all of this work, it's one of the most beautiful, incredible things I've ever seen. Really? It's not just how amazing the rendering athletically and proportionately this body is, it's that it's a true original from the ancient world that we didn't know existed for over 2,000 years. That just doesn't happen. I'm trying to Google it. I don't see it. And Antikythera youth is what I should look for? Search Ephebi. Oh, wow. There you go. Got it? Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, the detail in the hair. That came from the boat? Yes. How could you mess that up? Like, you know how bodies work. Oh, I'm seeing the pieces now. Yep, there you go. And art historians are getting PhDs writing about this restoration process. This is a big deal in the art world. Well, the thing is, like, you, you pull in on his face and you can see the care and precision that went into it. It also looks like he's pockmarked up from, you know, a bad bout of chicken pox or teenage acne or something from what the sea did to him. Or barnacles for 2,000 years. That'll also do it. Yeah, there's there's no medicine for that. But if you go and, and hang out in Rome or Greece or any of these places, and you hit all the museums, you go to the British Museum, you start to recognize these sculptures. I'm not, I'm not an expert, but you know, if I see Julius Caesar, I know it's Julius Caesar because I've seen that sculpture or one of the four or five others a billion times. It's got the haircut, doesn't it? The haircut certainly helps. Yeah, the shape of his nose and his neck. You just recognize him. Additionally, there is this... Uh, this boy lover of Hadrian who drowned in the Nile and a cult, a pagan cult around this kid developed. 
And he's one of the most sculpted people in the ancient world. And whether you're in the Vatican Museum or the British Museum or anywhere in between, you'll see sculptures of this kid everywhere. And eventually you're like, oh, there's that, there's that dude who drowned again. And so there are copies of copies of copies of copies of sculptures from the ancient world. And most of what you're seeing when you go to a museum are not originals. They're really good copies from, you know, the sculpture business. Is that what Michelangelo's David is copied after? Yeah. I mean, it does have a similar feel to Michelangelo's David. I mean, the pose is different. Michelangelo's David has a casual sweater thrown over his shoulder. But yeah, it is similar in style. But that's intentional because... Michelangelo was obviously a Renaissance sculptor, and the Renaissance was really just a celebration of the classical humanities. The way the Romans and the Greeks looked at art is what inspired the Renaissance artists. And so Renaissance means rebirth. It's a rebirth of that classical way of looking at the human body and doing art. That's why it's similar Hmm. at first glance. But no, this is a completely unique thing, and Michelangelo couldn't have been aware of the existence of this. Because it was under the ocean when Michelangelo was alive. Well, the Mediterranean Sea. And so when we pull this thing up and put it back together, you know, we can go scour the world and we don't have any others of this. We don't have a bunch of copies of this thing. And that wouldn't be such a big deal if it was a crappy sculpture. Well, no, no wonder no one wanted to copy your crappy sculpture. It's terrible. But this is a masterpiece. So it's like an intact or made intact, perfect model expression of this golden age of iconic art and it just it came back from the depths it came back out of nowhere and is reintroduced into this conversation about classical art and i just think that's amazing you can find old stuff a lot of places relatively speaking but to find something old and original is just unheard of archaeology is fascinating to me you know where i work i work on a oh yeah a test range right Mm -hmm. so I can walk the test range and I know very, very specific technology that's on the ground there. It's not that we're just littering the ground. It's just that, oh, well, you know, we didn't know where that went and and now we do. So we should pick that up. But sometimes you'll be walking and you're like, what is that? For example, it's a military installation. I was walking in the woods on the installation for a very specific reason. And I looked down and I saw absolutely huge bomb fragments because this place was used as a, a test range back in the forties. And so, you know, anytime we see something like that, we have to call it in and they come make sure it's safe and all that stuff. But just imagine this stuff that I'm seeing on the range. It's not unlike, you know, my friend Woodrow who likes to walk in the woods and look for arrowheads, except the arrowheads that we use today are super high tech and the ones that they used back then were made out of flint. Your sense of wonder is something I'm completely resonating with, but I'm going to push back a little. Bring it. I don't think anybody's going to care one bit about archaeology from the 20 teens. We document ourselves so dang well, no one's going to have to dig through anything to figure out who we were. You're wrong. All you're going to need is password to your email. And there, now, now you know who I am done oh in the 20 yeah, teens I mean, the 20 teens yeah i mean okay. we've got our trash sitting everywhere we've got there is such an overabundance like to find a childhood image of my grandfather i think we have four we're gonna be in like the 40 billion range with each of my kids yeah okay, i've unending supplies of pictures of my children and so do everyone we're just unless there is some kind of electromagnetic cataclysm that destroys everything electronic, I just don't think anyone's going to care or have to put any effort into excavating what we are right now. We love ourselves, and we are very good at documenting ourselves. So I just read this book, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Number one, what, what you're describing reminds me a lot of the library at Alexandria burning down. They put all the stuff in one place and it burned down, right? Dude, that hurts me for so many reasons I won't get into right now. Well, here's the deal. This book that I'm reading has to do with the end of the human civilization on Earth. It's a book called... Sounds like a blast. Oh, man. It's a book called Seven Eves. It's a very, very interesting book. It's very, very long. Seven Eves? Mm Mm-hmm. E-V-E-S. Seven Eves. Man, that's like the rrrr That's very difficult to pronounce. Okay. It is, but... One of the things that happens is, is, long story short, they have to get off Earth to save humanity. And 
they can only take what they can take at the time. And they have to make civilization last for a long time. But the point is, how do you know what you're going to take and, and how you're going to preserve it? Because right now, if you try to preserve things on thumb drives and stuff like that, if you take a hard drive in space, it can take a shot from cosmic radiation at any point in time and just be neutralized. Integrated, yeah. integrated surf circuits are very vulnerable in space. It's just the fact yeah. that we have an atmosphere that helps us. That is so interesting right now, too, because you know I've been spending a lot of time learning about text criticism, that is looking at ancient documents or copies of ancient documents and trying to add them all up together through comparison to figure out what the original must have looked like. And for me, I'm interested in that because of the New Testament, but for other documents as well. And I was talking with my friend Adam about this, and I was saying, you know, like, here's some of the objections and gripes people have with lack of source material from you know the very beginning of the New Testament. And he was like, well, even if all that stuff had been put on a hard drive, we wouldn't have the original anymore of that either. Nothing lasts like that. Things break down unless they're in perfect conditions. And so we feel like what we have now is going to be eternal, but you're right. It's going to get thinned out a lot. I still think stuff's just so well documented now. We have such an overwhelming amount that it would take something really special to destroy our self-documentation. You're right. Which means that if I can ever master the skill of reanimation, which is something I've been working on, and if I could find the corpse of the person who built that mechanism... We could bring them back to life, sit them down at the table, and they could answer every single one of our questions about how it works. I think Testicles would love to answer your questions. <laughs> Dude, I'm so sorry. I have to go. We, we told people we were going to talk about net neutrality, which... Yes. I just don't have time, man. I'm sorry. Thank you for playing along with me on this. We've been working on this for like three months. I've been telling you I wanted to talk about this, and so we haven't discussed it. It was really fun, and I didn't know anything about that device, and it's cool. Dude, this this tickles all the right parts of my brain. You've got, like, orbital mechanics. You have modern-day archaeology. You have, you know, machining techniques. You have mechanical engineering in the form of gearing and special types of gearing. This was a really, really good topic, and, I man, I could, I could learn way more on this. Yeah, and you have Alexander the Great and Archimedes and the Hellenistic Age and the Transformation of the classical world and all the stuff that I'm into. So yeah, it's it's almost as though this is a topic custom made for a podcast where a science person talks with a humanities person. <laughs> yeah. Could use more fart jokes next time. I'm disappointed in that. <laughs> oh, by the way, speaking of fart jokes, in all seriousness, I want to say your last video was incredible. <laughs> it was fantastic and those jokes dude <laughs> broke me <laughs> what, what me was it <laughs> what was the name of the the video so people can go go watch it Four hundred thousand errors in the bible <laughs> how did they get there dude it is so like it is the only it's the only video about the bible i've ever felt was too risque to share <laughs> <laughs> then it's working <laughs> good job yeah that dude. channel has finally jumped the shark i don't know i don't know what to say good job dude thanks man all right have a good one i gotta hey, go to bed fun nice work yeah Wait safe it. travels buddy thanks bye